Hello friends, how are you? I'm Marty Therger and today I'm going to talk about Gunhild. Welcome to October, the season of the witch, a much expected time of the year when the dark and cold starts to creep in. At twilight the wolf howls on the hills, the gap between worlds is opened and whatnot. So, Going along with the spirit of this season, and since this channel is mostly about Scandinavian studies, I'm going to start this month with Gunhild, a powerful woman, very powerful woman from the Norse sagas, whose life story is filled with witchcraft. One could even say she's possibly the most powerful witch of the old Norse sagas, and quite an intriguing life where fact and fantasy mixed together in a fantastical cocktail of trickery, plots, quest for power, death and sorcery. I do hope you enjoy this video. Gunhild, Gunhildr Kunungarmadir, mother of kings, was a famous Viking queen regarded as being a very powerful sorceress. What we know of her comes from various fragmented stories and luckily for us, she made a lot of enemies, so her stories were kept throughout generations precisely due to all the troubles she caused to her enemies. And she caused a lot of trauma to many and wasn't easily forgotten. Let's say that Gunhild is more or less to a certain extent the feminine version of Ragnar Lothbrok. It's quite possible that she just like Ragnar's accounts, is a work of fiction, a fusion of various historical and fictional characters, all pulled together by later authors as material or devices in their political stories. But not everything is pure fiction and it isn't solely a tale composed by blending different characters. We might not be entirely certain about the origins of Gunhild, which gives a drop of mystery, which is always great to maintain the sense of secrecy, magic and mystery, but we do know she was a 10th century queen, wife of Eric Bloodaxe, king of Norway, Orkney and Northumbria, all three kingdoms at once. In one version of the story, Gunhild was most likely the daughter of Gorm the Old, king of Denmark. One fateful day at a feast held by Gunhild's father, she was introduced to Eric Bloodaxe. Gorm the Old wanted to make a union between two houses, the Norwegian Inglinga family and with the early Danish monarchy. Well, no, a normal story, nothing abnormal or, or out of the ordinary, a bit boring actually. But in the Icelandic sagas, a much darker story is told about our dear and deadly sorceress Gunhild. You wouldn't want to mess with this one. In the Icelandic sagas, we are told she is the daughter of Ozur Toti from Halogaland in northern Norway. In this version, Eric Bloodaxe meets Gunhild when to him it is given five warships by his father. King Harald Fairhair of Norway. Eric Bloodhex sets out on a journey that ends, well, practically in the end of the world, at Finnmark, a very remote corner of northeastern Norway. Eric Bloodhex in Finnmark finds a beautiful woman who is held captive by two Finnish, uh, Finnar wizards. Eric comes to the hut where this woman is imprisoned. The wizards in question were not there. The woman is none other than Gunhild, and she tells Eric and his men that the wizards are the wisest and most powerful of all of Finnmark, and they have passed on to her their magic, and much she learned from them. Gunhild tells Eric that both wizards want to marry her, and so they protect her from all that might want to steal her away. They kill everyone that comes near the hut, so she tells Eric and his men to hide and wait for the sorcerers. She has a plan. When the sorcerers return the wizards, Gunhild suits the wizards, 
promising that no one has visited her while they were away. But they were very cunning and something wasn't right. The power of the land was with them and they could sniff out and track better than dogs. The two men stayed awake that night. They were jealous of each other and what kept them awake more than anything else was the prospect that one could take advantage of the other falling asleep and take Gunhild away for his wife while the other was distracted. Jealousy was consuming these men. Gunhild called both of them to her bed until they soundly slept. She tied them up, placing bags over their heads. She made the signal to the newcomers who came up uh, in a hurry and killed the wizards. They made to Eric's ship the next day and so Gunhild sailed with Eric Bloodhax to Alogaland to ask her father's permission for their marriage and Gunhild and Eric Bloodhax got eventually married and they set sail to the south. Now, this is the version of the story I like the most <laughs> because of her mysterious origins but it's important to take notice of something. In this version of the story, Gunhild's father is Osor Toti, not a very Norse-like name. And he's, he's clearly a person of importance in Halogaland, which is Sami territory. Osor Toti might have been a chieftain among the Sami, at the very least a Norse noble with clear Sami origins, which makes Gunhild of Sami origins. She was held captive by Finar wizards who didn't want any ransom, but being wizards and with a powerful Sami wife, most likely, uh, was because she was regarded as a sorceress, possibly a vulva, a seeress, and the wizards wanted her power. But we clearly have in this version of the story that she knew the magic of the Finar wizards, it has been taught to her, and at the time when these sources were written down, writers didn't distinguish between Finns and Sami people. You have to remember that these sources were written already during the Catholic period of Scandinavia. So much of the respect people had had in pagan times for both the Sami and the Finns was completely lost at this point. When these sources were written down to such Christian writers, both Sami and Finns were the exact same and were regarded as uncivilized, malicious and magical inhabitants of the far north uh, with their sinister ways. Typical portrayal of, of Christians when dealing with people who had not yet been converted and still kept their traditional ways. So, if you read the sagas, you will certainly notice a continuous inherent prejudice against these people, against the Sami and the Finns, always regarded as being uncivilized and witches in the pejorative sense of the term. The Norse pagans had a great respect for the Sami and the Finns and the land in which these peoples inhabited was once seen as sacred, but with the coming of Christianity, such lands and such people became known as unholy. So when these sources were written by Christian men, we can already see the loss of respect for these people and in later versions of the sagas translated to Norwegian, modern Icelandic, Danish, etc. in a post-colonial period, the sources change and there is a clear lack of knowledge about both the Sami and the Finns. And much of the translations of the sources in the post-colonial period are based on prejudice, which is also based on hearsay and rumors. So at this point, the north of Scandinavia was regarded as a place of unhallowed mysteries and the region of 
or Logaland, from which Gunhild has her own origins, was also regarded as the place from which most villains came from, the greatest villains in the sagas. So, this was much interiorized by contemporary Scandinavians to the point that there was, and there is, the belief that your homeland, your place of origins, says much about the type of person you are. So Gunnhild, coming from Hologaland, a place regarded as being an unholy place, automatically makes people believe that Gunnhild must be, without a doubt, a villain. So we do have to be careful with the sources because we are reading, uh, we are dealing with various versions, various translations that have been altered not only due to religion, but the mentality of each period. So, in great part, writing about Gunnhild and saying she is from Halogaland and that she knew about the magic of the Finns in great part is indeed meant as a slur upon her character to reinforce that she was indeed an evil woman, a powerful sorceress, a worker of evil. So do pay attention to that. Anyway, she was regarded as being too wild and dangerous as we shall see ahead. But remember that this portrayal of her was highly tampered with by Christians and by Lutherans during the post-colonial period. So, it's only natural throughout the sagas, most of the time she will be portrayed as the cause of all evils, as you will see. So, she was being held captive for good reason and her scheming to be set free by Eric Blood Axe worked. And Eric Poor Herrick, little did he know what he had, he, had set, he had set loose upon the world. Gunnhild also comes in Egil's saga. She is the arch enemy of the legendary hero Egil Skallagrimsson. The pair have a long history in the sagas, always in a sort of battle of wits. Egil and Gunnhild's story starts at a feast, an important feast held in honor of the guardian spirits. Gunnhild is the host, and Hegel, as a guest, did not behave appropriately. <laughs> and insults his host, Gunnhild. He insults the beer that has been served, which was considered a dire insult to the hospitality given by Gunnhild or, the, or, any, other, or any other person. From that moment on, these two never stopped trying to kill each other. Or rather, Gunnhild trying to kill Egil and Egil trying to escape and counterspell Gunnhild's curses and spells. But by insulting her hospitality, Gunnhild places poison on Egil's drinking uh, as a retaliation. But Egil, also being knowledgeable in magic and being cunning, perceived this action and carves protective runes on his drinking cup and activates them with his own blood and survives the poison. Basically, Egil knew pretty well he had done goofed and made a terrible mistake and was obviously expecting retaliation. So he was expecting uh, to be killed for it in some way and protected himself. Egil evaded Gunnhild's vengeance constantly throughout the sagas, which made Gunnhild absolutely infuriated. Egil is a trickster and always finds a way to escape Gunnhild's vengeance. Gunnhild is completely mad about it. She's unruly and a scheming character, but Egil didn't count on future events that completely turned things over. When Harald Fairhair, Eric's father, at the age of 80, turns over the rule of his kingdoms to his son. Gunnhild stops with her schemes and becomes a ruthless queen and politically dangerous, since she becomes the queen. Eric has 
the sole control of his father's lands. He names Gunhild's own son as his heir, a boy who would be remembered as Harald Greycloak, supposedly in some versions not Eric's son. Well, Gunhild's power is assured, she is the queen, there is no turning back. But Eric forgot that he that he had his own brothers, and by the rights of succession, after Eric died, the kingdoms should go to the eldest brother before him, unless he had a son of his own, etc., etc., which he didn't, apparently, and named his heir a bastard boy in some versions. He named as his heir Gunnhild's son, so a blood feud between the brothers started at the very early stage of Eric's reign, and Eric ends up killing four of his own brothers. Game of Thrones before it was cool. But in other versions, it's Gunnhild's schemes that are behind the king's actions, and his own brothers revolt against him because of Gunnhild's actions and plots. Gunnhild is on a personal, relentless quest for power, and many Jarls, many nobles, blame her sinister actions, which are clearly influencing King Eric, and many people are suffering because of it. Egil was a sorcerer himself, and he set up a macabre curse on Gunnhild because, well, nothing else seemed to stop her. Gunnhild in the sagas, her personal quest for power brings misery and destruction to many people. So, picture this now. Hegil set himself on top of a headland facing the seas below. He took a hazel staff and cut runes into the shaft uh, in a manner reserved only for the direst of situations. He fixed the pole on the ground, securing the severed head of a horse on top, pointing, pointing it towards the waves. He turned the head to face where Gunnhild and Herrick Bloodhex lay, and screamed out a curse to the skies that the guardian spirits of the land should drive them out of Norway as punishment for Gunnhild's actions against Egil and against Norway. The curse took hold of Eric and Gunnhild, and the fates were turned. Their path was now spiraling down towards disaster, and it would ultimately lead to Eric's death. Well, King Eric died, but Gunnhild is still the queen, and she is the she's she's still the one in charge, along with her son, as you remember, the boy Harald the Grey Cloak, who was the king and was named Eric's heir. After her husband's death, Gunnhild took a younger lover named Ruth, an Icelander who came to Norway to pursue a man who had taken his inheritance. Gunnhild offered her help, and Ruth did not refuse the help of a powerful Viking queen. Obviously, no one would refuse. Ruth was a generation younger than the queen, but that didn't stop them. But it was a, cr a case frowned upon because of the discrepancy of their age and because she took a lover just one year after the king had died. She did not waste time and she openly showed affections towards the younger lover. She had nothing to fear and many took her gesture as a sign that she thought of herself as a as the rightful ruler and could do whatever she then pleased without measuring the consequences and without showing any shame nor remorse not even the slightest sign of respect towards the death of the king ruth well her, her younger lover finally went after the man he was seeking into denmark in there he found a younger bride much younger than Gunnhild, a woman closer to his own age. Gunnhild was a sorcerer, she knew things that would be impossible to know unless she herself had been present there. She knew the fate of people even before any news would reach anyone. She accused Ruth 
of having a new lover, which he denied. But it was no use. Gunhild knew. Women know. Women always know. Ruth was afraid, for good reason, with good reasons, uh, of Gunhild's wrath. So he requested the king, Gunhild's son, to leave and return to Iceland. Before Ruth left, Gunhild's sweet, loving, hand cunning Gunhild gave him a gift, a fine gold bangle, a sort of bracelet. How thoughtful, such a generous gift from the queen. Well, it so happens. The piece of jewelry was a talisman with a curse in it, specially concocted by Gunhild just for her unfaithful lover. She cursed Ruth with a spell that he would have no pleasure with the woman he secretly intended to marry in Iceland. Ruth eventually married in Iceland with a woman named Hun. The curse was not made for him to become impotent, but on the contrary. The curse was to make sure he was hyperpotent. <laughs> Poor Hun was quite displeased. The man was a beast. No grace. He wasn't delicate. So she told her father how displeased she was, that Ruth clearly had a spell on his spindle. So her father advised her she should feign illness and take other men to her bed and be done with it, and then proclaim divorce. One day Ruth returned and his wife was gone. Gunhild's spell worked and she took her revenge. A little bit of humor in the sagas. Poor Ruth. Gunhild's fate eventually led her to Northumbria, and she never forgot her arch enemy Aegil. She blamed him for her fate's turn. So she worked a spell against him that Hegel would never find peace in Iceland until she could set her eyes upon him once again. Most likely so she could end his life with her bare hands. The fate of Gunhild was entwined with Hegel's. Hegel set sail eventually at some point to England and he was shipwrecked and the storm brought him directly to the shores of Gunhild's lands in Northumbria. Egil could not escape and he came himself before uh, Gunhild to ask her to recon uh, reconcile. But what drove Gunhild was her anger. Egil was sentenced to death and he was to be executed the next morning. But as a powerful sorcerer himself, he worked the entire night on a poem to praise Eric, which in, in this version of the, the sagas was still alive. And so Eric let him go. He liked the poem. <laughs> After a series of events and the bloodshed marked by Eric's reign, the people of England blamed Gunhild for all the misfortunes brought by Eric. Gunhild fled at once to Orkney and there she stood for a time until she heard that her brother, Harald Bluetooth, was king of Denmark. And so she moved to Denmark. She took refuge with Harald Bluetooth, who gave her lands and supported her. And Gunhild stayed in Denmark for many years. She, her sons and her brother fought to reclaim Norway from Haakon and uh, through her dark magic, Hawkon was mortally wounded by an arrow to the shoulder. They took back the kingdom of Norway, and so Gunhild reveled in her position when her son, Harald Greycloak, came into power once again. Gunhild was ruthless in her position of power once again, she wasn't idle and many more disastrous events befell those under her rule. Kings ruled the kingdoms, surely, but it was her will behind them, dictating what should be done. During her son's reign, Gunhild absolutely dominated the court. Gunhild controlled her sons and her sons were responsible for deposing many of the Jarls and petty kings that had ruled Norway before. Gunhild, through her sons, 
both the king and other sons, was responsible for taking away the power of nobility in Norway. So obviously many of the nobility were quite displeased with Gunnhild and the reign of tyranny she was fomenting. But this is a very typical action from many medieval monarchs throughout Europe. Many European kings in reality had no real power because the true power was with the nobles. Those who owned lands, property and most had way more wealth than kings. Many European monarchs set out on a quest to destroy the power of the nobility and seize that power for their own. Gunhild was actually pretty genius and if she truly wanted to secure the power of her family, she made good use of her, of her sons as tools to diminish the power of nobility and secure the dominance of her family. Gunhild ruled with iron fist and such was the storm she brought upon the Viking kingdoms of the 10th century that even her own brother, Harald Bluetooth, had to finally turn against her, thus ending a reign of terror. Gunhild was politically dangerous and Harald Bluetooth wanted to seize Norway for his own, so he made good use of the Norwegian nobility that was displeased with Gunhild. Gunhild was now an old woman. Her son, the king, had been killed in a plot between Harald Bluetooth and the nobleman of Norway. Gunhild fled to her daughter in Orkney, uh, once again, where she ruled until all the men under her influence were dead. Gunhild outlived her husband and her son. She was the mind behind her husband's decisions and through schemes, trickery, curses, spells and wits, most of all, she was the true ruler of the Vikings, the mother of kings, the greatest sorceress in the Norse sagas. Until, of course, her own brother killed her. Well, she was thrown into a bog and drowned. Because drowning was how Christian Norsemen dealt with witches. After all, it, it was Harald Bluetooth who introduced Christianity in Denmark and converted the kingdom to the new religion and obviously united the kingdoms of Denmark and Norway, consolidating his rule and spreading Christianity in Scandinavia. It is very possible that Gunnhild's portrayal as a sorceress, a witch, was intentionally created to help medieval Scandinavians to interiorize that Gunnhild was indeed a bad person and not a suitable wife for a king. And she was the cause of King Eric's reign of bloodshed and tyranny, as well as her son's reign of tyranny. So, a really bad reputation was built around Gunnhild to justify the king's actions and to pass on the image that she was a bad influence precisely for being a sorceress. But in all truth, Gunnhild seems to have been the mastermind behind Herrick's and Herald's reign because her objective seems to have been indeed to lower the power of the nobility to obviously aggrandize the power of the king, her own power and the power of her family, to secure that power. But the thing is, in pre-Christian Scandinavia, it was nobility that held the religious power. Much of the rituals and ceremonies and other religious performances were performed by the nobility and the great majority were performed by noble women. Many people from all classes, from all social ranks, came to visit great centers of power precisely to witness the religious ceremonies held by the nobility, by priestesses. In pre-Christian Scandinavia, during the Iron Age and early Viking period, the great religious events we know of were performed by 
priestesses from nobility. And obviously many men from nobility, even kings, would take for wife women from the same social ranks within nobility. The wives of chieftains, landlords, heirsar, jarls, kings were also priestesses. Not because they specifically choose priestesses for wives, but because it was the duty of a noble woman and of a queen to perform the religious ceremonies for her and the king's subjects. It was expected of her to continue on with the traditions. Religion and political power walked hand in hand. This is the continuation of the proto-Germanic tradition of the wife of the chieftain of the tribe being the sorceress of the tribe. The chieftain holds the political and military power and his wife holds the magical religious power. The concept was actually introduced when Indo-Europeans came in contact with more matriarchal societies all over Europe and there was a fusion of religious beliefs, a fusion of male sky gods with female solar deities and so the chieftain and his wife were the personification of the divine couple, the god of war and rulership with the goddess of magic, prophecy and life. The chieftain's wife was the figure who would later become the prophetess, the vulva in Scandinavia. As I've said before, the term vulva is a term loosely applied to a variety of women who held a certain religious and spiritual power among the pre-Christian Scandinavians. Anyway, the chieftain's wife could take on the role of the vulva in certain aspects. Germanic peoples, especially during the Bronze Age, had a political system which relied very much on the war band concept, a tightly organized military society whose figures of power were the chieftain and his wife. The wife of the warrior leader held the role of prophetess and to be to the outcome of her prophecies through means of divination influenced the outcome of any action that was to be taken by the warband. The chieftain's wife was the sorceress of the warband and she also presided on both the temporal and spiritual power in the warband's ritual feasts. So, in pre-Christian Scandinavia, until at least the early Viking period, this was still a tradition kept among the nobility. So, <laughs> all of this to tell you that building up a tale and portraying Gunnhild as a sorceress, and therefore a bad influence upon King Herrick, it seems to me to be a later creation by Christian authors trying to precisely end this tradition and take out from the nobility, the nobility the religious power. Taking out the old pagan traditions from the nobility to easily implement Catholicism. If the nobility is completely devoid of religious power and abandon the old pagan ways, it would certainly be easier to implement the new religion within the nobility itself and the nobility would serve as a religious tool to continue to spread the new religion upon its subjects. So, we have two situations in here concerning Gunhild. To pre-Christian Scandinavians, it would be perfectly normal for a king or to have a sorceress as a wife. Gunhild was, after all, from nobility itself and it was her duty to keep the magical religious tradition and perform the ceremonies and rituals. She might, might not have been a sorceress originally, but simply re regarded as a priestess and prophetess when she became the king's wife, because it was expected of her to continue on with the tradition of being the head of the religious performances held by the nobility. But a portrayal of being an evil witch, being captive and her power was held 
and being freed by the future king which unleashed a chain of events that influenced the king and turned him into a ruthless tyrant seems already to be Christian influences upon the account of Gunhild precisely to find justification that a sorceress is not a proper wife for a king because by acknowledging the old ways and bring them into the monarchical panorama clear, clearly ends up in disgrace. So this part was a sort of Catholic propaganda against the old ways and tr try to discourage the, the nobility from clinging to the old ways of their forebears. Alright my dear friends, I hope you have enjoyed this video and I hope you continue to enjoy this month, this month of October. I will have some videos concerning witchcraft, obviously. <laughs> so, thank you so much for watching, see you on the next video and as always, tá curioso?